we used to, but um, it felt maybe appropriate to try to reclaim it. I'm not sure how effective that is, but it does have a nice cachet to it. Um, and reinventing the, the connotative layers of these words, I think is, is sometimes an interesting strategy to take with, um, with topics that are contentious. So I wanna start by um, going back in time. Um, and if, if you look at the world before we dispersed from Africa, it looked very different than it does today. Um, this is what England uh, may have looked like. These species are present in England 117,000 years ago, um, along with all of the other species that we're familiar with today. North America had horses, several species, up to five species of horses, musk, oxen, ground sloths, um, mammoths. And Australia, of course, had its own diversity of crazy animals. Um, this thing on the left here, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but yeah. this is the Miharang, 400 kilogram flightless goose. Just super weird. Um, and just to show you this graphically, I hope this doesn't overwhelm you. Um, the x-axis here is millions of years ago. So this is time with the present being at zero. And this is body mass of the world's mammal communities. Um, this vertical bar is when the dinosaurs went extinct around 66 million years ago. And you can see that over time, after the dinosaur extinctions, body mass increased dramatically um, and kind of plateaued around 35 million years ago. Um, this vertical bar here is when most modern genera of species show up. So everything in this time period would be pretty familiar to us if you're a naturalist today. And most modern species showed up around two and a half million years ago. The entirety of the Holocene, which is the last interglacial um, when the climate was similar to today's fits in this vertical black bar. It's actually narrower than, than that. Just to give you a sense of scale, this vertical black bar is the nature that we think of when we think of nature. And just to show you an example with North America, I should have remade this for Australia, but I didn't have the time. This is North American, oops. I don't know why I did that. This is North American body masses, maximum body mass. And you can see that it was extremely high. And then when humans show up, it collapses. So this is native maximum body mass today in North America. Australia had a similar pattern of reduction around 80,000 years ago, also within that vertical black bar. And today's mean body mass is down here, which is remarkably similar to what it was 64 million years ago. And this led to really radical changes in how the earth works, the loss of these big animals, because these big animals do things that smaller animals do not do. Um, they're uniquely capable of ripping up the ground, of knocking over trees, and of eating vegetation that smaller herbivores cannot. Um, as you may know, donkeys and horses can eat very, they eat a lot, but they can eat lower quality forage than a comparable sized ruminant species. Um, and it scales up. So mammoths could eat wood. Um, and in taking that plant matter and digesting it, not only did they change plant communities and change the reflectivity of the earth, the albedo of the earth, which can cool the earth, they also increase nutrient cycling rates. Many parts of the Siberian tundra, for instance, um, during the last ice age, were actually more productive than they are now, um, which is strange because they're warmer now during this interglacial and should be less and should be more productive. But the, the action of these animals actually increased nutrient cycling rates, kept the ground colder, and um, turned these shrub dominated systems today into these rich, hyper rich grasslands with tons of animals. Um, big animals are also essential for moving nutrients. Um, they, are, they are the veins of the earth. Um, people have looked at the nutrient distributions in coal beds before and after the evolution of big animals. And before the evolution of big animals, nutrients are patchy. They're only in areas downhill in where, where things collect. But when animals showed up, they began pumping those nutrients uphill. Um, it's a process that doesn't happen without animals, which is pretty incredible. Yeah. When these animals went extinct, the world changed drastically. Um, we have pollen records and lake bed sediment records that show that wildfire frequency and severity increased dramatically. As likewise, areas that were once savanna-like savanna became fire-tolerant woodlands or closed canopy woodlands, um, leading to really different differences in climate and possibly leading to the loss of other smaller bodied species. Um, so this is unfortunately 
something that hasn't changed. Um, large animals, megafauna, as we can call them, are the most endangered functional group of species on Earth. This includes horses and donkeys. Um, and if you map them, this is, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the IUCN, but the IUCN is the global conservation organization, the foremost authority on the trends of species, um, the trends of biodiversity, of which species are endangered or not. And if you map, use their data to map the distribution of megafauna today, this globally endangered functional group, you'll see that they're mostly in Africa, um, some in Southeast Asia, and absolutely none in Australia. This is looking at megafauna over 100 kilograms. Um, and 60% of those surviving species are endangered, which is pretty wild. Mm -hmm. But what's even more interesting about this to me is that this map, which is by the foremost scientists in conservation, the most trustworthy source of data you can imagine, is actually not true. It's actually a lie. If you map where megafauna actually are today, you see a very different picture. So Australia becomes almost as species rich as parts of Asia, as do much of North America and South America, and even parts of Europe. And this is because these animals, these introduced organisms, have been considered um, have no conservation value, to not be biodiversity, and have been omitted from our understandings of biodiversity change. And that is especially surprising because 24% of modern extant megafauna species are introduced somewhere. And eight, um, two of those are extinct in their native ranges, and another eight are threatened. Um, so these introduced organisms, like horses and like introduced donkeys, are actually, I mean, donkeys especially, their native range in East Africa, there's about maybe 100 to 300 individuals left. And they have established thriving populations in North America, Australia, oh. South America. Oh. So this is, you know, a great diversity of organisms. We have the world's only population of feral camels, which is in Central Australia. The horses in the White Mountains, I'm sure you're familiar with them, the Brumbies, I guess you'd say. Water buffalo in North America and South America. And then of course these really bizarre cocaine hippos that uh, escaped from Pablo Escobar Zoo in Colombia. Um, and this is really a part of a process that um, we're all familiar with. We've all partaken in. I grew up in upstate New York and then spent most of my adult life in Arizona, down here in the Southwest, and then went to graduate school in Sydney and I'm now in Denmark, riding these red lines that have connected the world across ancient biogeographic barriers. And as we've done this for our own sakes, we've also moved plenty of other species around the world which raises a, a number of conservation questions. Um, on one hand, these organisms do this. This is a site in Death Valley National Park that has been trashed by wild donkeys. It's been turned into a mud pit. And sites like this are why people refer to these organisms as pests. But that hardly encapsulates what the entirety of what these animals do. And nor is it the best way to do research on these organisms if you start from the premise that these animals are bad. But despite that, killing these animals, as we know, and I'm sure as the, the Brumby people here are, are familiar with, is one of the major activities in conservation. Um, and that's what I wanted to look at. This is a couple, this is one of the papers. And I'm sorry, I, I, I don't have a preview screen here. Um, I, Zoom can be so annoying. And I did change the slideshow up a little bit this morning. So some of these surprise slides are gonna take me by surprise. So I hope you can bear with me and be patient if my uh, oration doesn't make full sense. This is a paper that we worked on, that I worked on a couple of years ago, um, which published in PNAS, which is one of the foremost um, scientific journals in the world. And we wanted to know how to understand these introduced organisms, these, these big animals, in the context of Earth's history. Given that the Earth for 60, for about 35 million years was dominated by big animals, how do we understand these introduced ones? Are they fundamentally novel? Are they, do they have traits? that make them incompatible with modern ecosystems? Or are they potentially restoring lost processes and influences? And the final possibility too is perhaps they amplify these extinctions by introducing already present functions, ecological capacities to influence the environment. So to look at this, we started by looking at the traits of all these animals um, extinct and introduced over the last 120,000 years. The way an organism affects the environment as many of us know is determined by their traits. 
if you look at a donkey, for instance, they have a hind gut fermentation system, which means that they can process food, different types of food than a ruminant could that have a, has a foregut highly efficient system like a cow. Um, these animals also vary in terms of their diet, which is different effects on vegetation, but also on wildfire and shrub expansion and nutrient cycling rates. We looked at body mass and we looked at habitat and limb morphology. I'm sure you've all heard in Australia that introduced herbivores are fundamentally deleterious because they have hooves, um, which That's is actually funny. Because, yeah. What? We hear that often. <laughs> you know, it's actually pretty funny because the short faced kangaroos mm -hmm. uh, that you once had, yeah. they had hooves too. They had a morphology almost identical to an open plains horse mm -hmm. in terms of their limbs, which is pretty wild. Yeah. Um, and so we took those traits, and I don't need to bore you with the math, but we calculated the dissimilarity between each species and every other species in their continents. And we found, amazingly, that the majority of introduced herbivores are most similar to extinct species in their new homes. Wild donkeys share many traits with giant wombats. Wild horses in Australia share many traits with this guy, just like Bantang do, this Zygomaturus trilobus. That includes hindgut fermentation, similar body mass, and similar diets. Um, and so 93% of herbivores introduced in Australia are not most similar to extant species, species that are there right now, native species, but are closely similar to species that went extinct, wow. which is pretty remarkable. That's, wow. That's really interesting. <laughs> yes. It is, and it, it raises a lot of questions about what these animals are doing. Yep. <clears throat> I'm gonna skip a couple um, other complicated analyses and skip to this one, which, where we focus just on two traits, diet and body mass. And these two traits control the metabolic effect of herbivores on the environment. What are they eating and how much of it and how, what the quality of that food is. And so if you look at this, these tiles, each tile is a functional group, um, a combination of body mass on the x-axis here and diet, dietary yield on the y-axis. The blue tiles are, are groups that survived these extinctions at the end of the Pleistocene. The red groups are extinct functional groups, red tiles. And the, the light green ones are ones that are restored by introductions. If you look at Australia, these points are species, by the way. If you look at Australia, you can see that these extinctions led to the loss of almost everything above 60 kilograms. And all the browsers between 25 and 60 kilograms. Just an incredible loss of the capacities of herbivores to influence the vegetation of Australia. Introductions amazingly have restored 60% of those lost functional groups and have introduced a novel functional group. Um, Australia never really had big grazers, which is pretty interesting, um, unlike most other continents which had big grazers. And these animals have really interesting effects, which have very rarely been studied in the context of Earth's history. And they're usually studied only in the context of how the world should be, how it was first described by Europeans. And so just to give you an example of one of the little stories that we have, um, Werner et al. in 2006 did a um, fantastic study, one of the few really high quality studies on introducing herbivores, where they set up long-term experimental plots in Northern Australia in the monsoonal tropics and found that grazing by water buffalo reduced fire frequency and severity and increased tree establishment and growth rates. These animals are shifting the system, much like we see when we look at the paleo records from prehistory, these, just, these animals were shifting the system from burning, from, these, from vegetation being consumed by fire on the landscape to that vegetation being consumed in their stomachs um, through digestion, which has profound influences on many things. Um, I don't think anyone really likes fire. Some of us you know, understand the need for fire, but herbivores can really shift that, mm -hmm. which raises questions about what Australia would look like First of all, if we let these animals be, but also what it might have looked like if these extinctions hadn't happened, if there still were giant wombats and like, protodons and the various giant kangaroos um, roaming those landscapes. Um, another interesting note, and I know you guys are more interested in brumbies, um, but feral pigs have my heart too, and I would love to do more research on them. Um, there are a lot of things that we look at in the world like this, places that have been rooted by wild boar for instance, and I'm sure some of you have seen places like this in Australia in the Blue Mountains. Um, and these, this, you know, this is categorized and described as a harm by almost everybody um, that this place is destroyed, which forgets the fact that disturbance is essential for ecosystems. 
an essential component of how ecosystems work is through disturbance. And if you look at the paleo record, there were numerous species that did similar things in almost every continent and landform. This Zygomaturus trilobus, this very large Iconodon, has more skull morphology suggesting that much like wild boar, they were rooting through soil and consuming underground plant parts. These giant rat kangaroos, which are about 20 kilograms, um, related to the, I think it's Pothoriidae, it's a weird little rat kangaroo you have in your rainforests. These were almost certainly rooting as well. Um, and rooting is interesting because it mixes leaf litter into the soil, um, which can increase decomposition rates and increase nutrient availability. Um, studies have found that while rooting leads to carbon emissions from the soil, it actually leads to increased carbon sequestration by increasing the, the microbial activity in soils, um, which can increase tree growth rates. That was shown in Tennessee, where wild boar are also considered a pest. And interestingly, in Northern Australia, there was a study that found that birds, um, cockatoos, and these big mixed flocks preferentially forage in areas turned over by wild boar disturbances because seeds and termites, various other resources are exposed to them that would otherwise be buried in litter and dense vegetation with possible risk of predation by other animals. Which raises this question. Um, if I, if I was in Australia or North America with a land manager, with a conservationist, and we were to see a wetland like this, we would call this a place that was destroyed. This would be an harm. Um, and yet this is a place in Africa where these animals never went extinct. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you were to think about what is natural, if you wanna use that idea at all, this is far more natural than it, this landscape without big animals, in which case this would be a verdant wetland full of vegetation. That's actually the novel, the novel state of the last 10,000 years, 80,000 years in Australia, which is very aberrant to how the world has been for most of its history. And indeed, um, if you were to try to, one of, the, one of the key problems with invasion biology and with the ways that we study these introduced animals is that if we didn't know these animals were introduced, would we be able to tell from their actual effects? If I was an alien ecologist, would I be able to tell that feral camels or feral horses are any different ecologically than native zebras and native elephants? Africa provides us this wonderful opportunity because it is the one continent that didn't lose these big animals, whereas every other continent did. So what do these animals actually do? Um, and this is how I got started on all of this. These are some some donkeys in Arizona. Um, I spent a lot of my time working in the deserts, which are really beautiful, amazing ecosystems, um, incredible, incredible plant diversity and landform diversity. And um, some of the few places left in the world where animals can actually roam over large landscapes because these landscapes are largely economically unviable and so um, have been left alone, unlike a lot of our forests. Um, and of course, the drylands and deserts cover around a third of Earth's surface. So they provide, they, they're really important when you think about the earth and its global climate and its global biodiversity. Um, most of our understandings of these big animals, these megafauna come from temperate ecosystems from the Serengeti, which is tropical or from Northern Europe or from the Great Plains in North America. And we know very little about what they do in these desert systems. Of course, deserts are defined by their water, um, by their lack thereof of water. Um, in many systems in the desert, uh, you may have running surface water during part of the year, and then that surface water goes subsurface as plants begin using it and as, it, as distance from rainfall events increase. And that's where donkeys and horses seem to play a really important role. So let me see if I can get this going. Yeah. Oh, wow. While I study this in North America, and I'm, I'm really sorry for this joke. It, I should have taken it. I'm so sick of telling it, but you can also call these uh, assholes if you'd like. Um, not only does this happen in North America, but it also happens in Australia. There's accounts. Um, there's a book, I forget the name, but it, an older book, some farmer documented and described the anecdotes about all the feral and introduced animals in Australia. And he described horses in Queensland, in the outback, digging wells so deep that they disappeared in them. 
which is quite astounding. Oh, and I would love if anyone has any tips about where I can find that in Australia, I would love to know. Yeah. So this, this, this behavior, this was recently published in Science, which is, I never would have dreamed that was possible, um, actually has pretty profound influences on water availability. So this x-axis here is temperature, and the y-axis here is percent of total water available in a system. And you can see that the amount of water contributed by equid wells, which is what these points are on each survey day, is highly variable. But in some sites, provides up to 100% of the water in the entire system, which is quite profound. In addition to increasing the amount of water, these features also increase the density of water. So the number of distinct water points along these streams. And they reduce the isolation of these water features to each other. Both of these processes, properties have a lot of implications for how organisms use water. Um, water points in deserts can be uh, focal points of interaction, of competition, of disease transmission, of predation. So by increasing the number of features um, and changing their distribution, these animals have a, a large effect on this vital resource. Um, and yes, many other organisms do use these. These are wild native pigs, peccaries, which we have in the Southwest, who um, every day would come and lay and drink in these features. Um, overall, there were some 40 or 45 species that regularly drink from these waters, these equid dug waters. Um, this graph on the bottom here is the number of visits um, out to background waters or nat natural waters, I don't like that word, equid wells, or to dry controls within the same areas. And you can see that as temperature increases, um, these features become heavily used, even more so than these background natural waters, um, and possess high species richness or number of species per night, and the duration of visits by other species. Um, and there's just an image of a horse. Um, we had one population of horses in our study area that dug very deep wells, sometimes a meter and a half in depth, oh. uh, and sometimes providing only water in the system. Um, another interesting thing that stems out of this is that these wells seem to mimic the conditions that some of our most important riparian tree species need to germinate. Um, these plants are dependent upon floods and the disturbances that floods create uh, by scouring out competing vegetation and depositing moist mineral substrate to germinate on. Unfortunately, floods have become rare because we've dammed many of the rivers of the world, almost a great number of them. But interestingly, by digging wells, the, this, the process of disturbance by wild donkeys simulates, you can see all the wells here in satellite imagery, simulates the conditions these trees need. And so many of the trees in these floodplains are actually in old wells once dug by donkeys, which is another overlooked phenomena. Hmm. It's just an image of the germination rates, but you don't need to look at this before. Um, so what we propose with this is that exposing surface subsurface water is actually a function that was once ubiquitous um, by now extinct animals. Um, a wombat was documented not too long ago digging a well of four meters in depth in Australia. Giant wombats very likely could have dug wells even deeper in central Australia, which suggests that donkeys and horses may be restoring features that are quite similar to things that were once around. Um, the things that are mapped here are the dry lands of the world and their possible expansion. And the red are where extinct species, potential well diggers once were, and the blue are where um, introduced equids today are, which is a pretty remarkable thing that they've brought this function, this capacity to increase surface water to so many parts of the earth. But again, we have places like this, and actually I think, that, did I screw this up? Let me see, no. Um, we have places like this that conservationists are still going to talk about. Um, this is Death Valley National Park. They're in the midst of trying to remove the entire donkey population from this area um, because of sites like this, which ignores something really critical, um, which really needs, we need to take into account whenever we talk about these animals. And that's predation. Um, my PhD advisor uh, did a study in 2010 published in Ecology Letters, which is a very uh, important high impact journal in ecology, showing that killing dingoes leads to, to environments increases in donkey abundance and disturbance and increases in red foxes and reductions in small native mammals. Um, if we under want to understand these animals like donkeys and horses, we also need to pay attention to their predators because their effects do not emerge um, in isolation. 
Um, so just to show you though, how much we think that they do, these are, this is the number of articles, scientific articles about horses and donkeys in North America. The light red bar shows that these are studies that never mention whether there's predators in the system. The dark red ones, the darkest red ones, explicitly deny that these animals have predators or could be influenced by predators. And there's only a couple studies where the potential is acknowledged or actually studied. Um, killing predators is one of our greatest contributions to Earth's ecosystems. We love doing it for some reason, both to protect mm. livestock, as with these dingo killings, and also for fun. Um, and it has powerful implications for how these animals, like feral animals, like wild donkeys and wild horses, affect ecosystems. Um, yeah, so just ways going forward, um, I have a whole presentation I could give about the ways that mountain lions change the ecology and the effects of donkeys. But, um, which I could do, we have, I think I have 15 minutes left, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah. just to, to go forward a little bit further, um, we have a deep need for additional research on these animals uh, as wildlife. Mm. Instead of studying them as pests, where anything they do is by definition harm, we need to study them just like we would any other organism. Just like we would study those rhinoceroses and how they affect wetlands in Africa, we should study feral equids. Um, and we need to look at this particularly um, in the context of predation, because ignoring predation is like ignoring rainfall when studying a plant. And just one little thing, I'm not sure how familiar you are with this, but this is a very exciting project, um, which I hope, which could definitely use more support. Um, Kachana Station is the last refuge of wild donkeys in the Kimberley of Australia. And I'm not sure how familiar all of you are with this, but the Western Australian government, the Australian government, I'm not sure if it was the state government or the national government, has successfully eradicated donkeys from everywhere else in the Kimberley region using the Judas technique, um, which is quite horrific. Yeah, um, and I'm sure you're aware of this. I think it was $73 million that have been spent to kill. Is this Ariane's? Is this the current research that Ariane is involved in? Yeah. yeah so yeah, okay. trying to, we we have some preliminary stuff going, and we're hoping to get. Okay. Um, so the government want to destroy the population, and they've nearly done so, except for Chris Hengler. So he's okay. uh, he runs Kachana Station, and he runs it from a holistic perspective, attempting to restore soil health. Um, and reduce the flammability of the ecosystem. Um, much of this ecosystem is heavily burned, both with controlled burns and wild and lightning burns, leading to a loss of many of the rainforests that once collect, once once grew in the various canyons of that system. He thinks, from his observations, that the feral donkeys, the wild donkeys, play a really key role in reducing wildfire frequency and severity. And we would like to know if that's true. So we're hoping to begin research there. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, the government is doubling down on its desire to eradicate these donkeys. So whether or not we can actually get any research done before they do that remains to be seen. Yeah. Um, um, so Eric, I'm, I've just, got, about, a, I've just got something that's come up, Eric, um, in relation to your last slide. And I'd just like to bring this question to you. Um, coming from Chase, wondering, are you aware that the um, Henglers have actually been advised that they do need to cull their donkeys? Yeah, I am aware. Yeah. Oh, that, right. Um, Is that yeah, by the so government, do you mean, Renee? Um, I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's a question that um, Chase has just put up. I think there's current litigation. I think that's actually going to court if it's related it? to this. Yes, station. the WA, yeah, the WA yeah. government. Okay, it's in court. Yeah. It's in court. Yeah. Okay. Right, so Chase, you, you would know that it's in court then? I, I would imagine if you're involved in um, stopping it. So, um, yeah, obviously Chase has got some involvement in, oh, okay. in this. So it um, be interesting to follow up with Chase. Okay. Yeah, yeah thanks. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Chase. <laughs> oh, we got, five, we got five questions popping up. Okay. About those and then I can talk about predation if, if there's a lull but I feel like um, mountain lions are not as quite as relevant to your world in Australia so perhaps I'll save it um, I can load this Q&A up um,
Well, it looks like it's mostly um, questions from Chase. But Chase, thanks for the work that you're doing this. Um, I have seen your name before. Um, and I, I, I hope to get more involved with that project um, in the future, especially doing the field research on it. Oh, wow, a lot of questions from Chase. Yeah, um, I'm just wondering if this is um, Chase Day that I know from Project Hope Horse Welfare. I think it might be. Oh, okay. So Chase yeah. is involved in, in stopping yeah. the cull. That's good. Yeah. Is, yeah, I'll have to ask. Um, yeah, okay. I, I'd seen an article, I'd seen a write-up about the litigation and that it was, yeah, on foot. So that's interesting. Okay. Sure. Like is. to hear from Chase. Uh, yes, it is Chase Day that I know from Project Hope. So thanks, Great. Chase. I'll, I'll be right. in touch. <laughs> yeah, we need to know about that. Yeah. Okay. Small world. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I'm uh, just looking through some questions here. Um, Eric, um, you can see the questions that are, are coming up as well on the screen. Well, I see something from Candace about turning over ground. Yeah. Um, well, the, the interesting thing about this question, Candace, is that you describe it as, as many of us are taught to do um, in terms of benefits um, and harms. Um, benefits and harms are not scientific terms. The only way they can be scientific is if you're extremely clear what your outcome measurement is, what you say is good, but they're ultimately ethical terms. Um, they're ultimately saying how the world should be, how it ought to be. And that is very dangerous terrain. Um, should the world not be turned over? Should it be turned over? Should the soil be disturbed or not? What we know is that it's a process that's occurred for probably 35 million years, animals turning over soil and on every continent and island. Is that good or is that bad? We can't say as scientists. So it is, um, we need to be careful when we think about how we describe these organisms. Um, we can fall into pitfalls of moralizing them as pests or of moralizing them as um, heroes, ecological heroes, which is really challenging because we often think of the world this way and it's just kind of a natural way to think about organisms, mm -hmm. but it really isn't a scientific way to think about them. Um, mm. When pigs turn over soil, there are a lot of effects that you could describe as harmful and a lot of effects that you describe as benefits, depending yeah. on how you want to use those terms. That's something that came to my mind when you were talking about, well, pigs rooting up the ground. That is something we see here. And it's something that is thrown up as harmful. And in fact, I think even Brumby advocates say that, oh, Brumbies don't do damage. Look at what the pigs are doing. Pigs but do. in fact, we shouldn't be doing <laughs> It's, you know, it's all density. So if, if you have a million pigs in an area, you're going to get so yeah. much turn, soil turnover that you're going to lose a lot of the species that can't handle that. Mm. Uh, and those densities are influenced by predators and by other factors. So yeah. if we essentialize these organisms as good or bad, we really are, are doing science and them a disservice. And all it takes to, if we, if we throw pigs under the bus, um, then it's very easy for somebody to use the same logic to throw horses under the bus yeah. or any species. If we didn't know those pigs were native or not, would we be able to tell from their effects? Mm. I yeah. highly doubt it. Yeah, got a question here from Kath Brown, Eric. Um, she's <laughs> interested to know whether the research from Equid impacts on water quality and availability on arid regions translates to alpine and temperate riparian environments. Um, wait, can you say that one more time? Yeah, I'm interested to know whether the research from equid impacts on water quality and availability in arid regions translates to alpine and temperate, temperate yeah. riparian environments. I think it could, it depends on the system. Um, I was, you know, it's funny, this, this phenomena has been, not really been studied, but it does show up in various literatures. So there's a island Canada, Canada Sable Island, as yes. well as the islands yes. in uh, the Carolinas, the barrier islands that have wild horses. And yeah. apparently in those systems, the only fresh water is provided by digging um, to perch aquifers. I think at Sable Island, one half of the island has some natural mm -hmm. uh, ponds and the other half of the island water just goes right to the soil, the sand. Um, so horses dig for it. Um, yeah, so this definitely shows up elsewhere. Um, it's just going to be very, I mean, even in the deserts too, it's super context specific, whether this shows up 
and what kind of effects it has because these systems are so variable. So it's really a, it's more about a, an organismal capacity to buffer water availability. And, you know, the way I think about it too, is that, um, uh, you know, beavers can create ponds, wetlands by slowing down, spring, creating dams and damming rip streams, but they also live in big rivers that aren't dammed, um, where, where they're solely eating trees. Um, we can tend to think of these animals as you know, in essentialist ways of being one thing or another when a uh, broader perspective is just that they're wildlife and that they're doing things based on local ecological contexts. Yeah. Um, have a question here from Libby Lovegrove. Hi, Libby. Good to see you. Um, just wanting, just mentioning that um, a few years back, they, well, she had a visit from Craig Downer, ecologist who researches um, the Mustangs as well. Um, Eric, are you, are you aware of his work? We are researching Brumbies here in the Kimberley. Um, I am aware of Craig's work and I would like to chat with him sometime. I'm, I'm, um, I haven't, um, I don't know how to say this exactly. I haven't found opportunity to collaborate with him yet or right. a way to, but okay. in, in some ways, um, yeah, it's tricky. There's politics, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, that's I see a question from uh, Paul Griffin that I would love to, I know Paul. Um, oh, okay, go, yeah. Uh, and let me just read this out loud. Um, the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, and I'm not sure if people are familiar with this, but I'll, I'll hope this explains it, suggests that excessive disturbance can reduce biodiversity. Um, you demonstrate that equids, primarily burrows or donkeys, can create open water sources in the beds of certain sandy or gravelly intermittent streams during some seasons. But Science um, published two letters critiquing you for not acknowledging ecologically damaging effects of wild horses and burrows when they are overpopulated relative to available natural resources. In your response, you concluded that feral equids like other introduced species can change ecosystems in ways that alarm us. The main concern of agencies like the Bureau of Land Management, which manages horses and, bur and donkeys in North America, in the United States, is that the population size of local horse and burrow herds is many times greater than available resources. These species are protected on BL BLM lands. Considering that these animals are protected in the Western United States, you recommend aiming for an intermediate level of disturbance. Well, this is a super interesting question, Paul, as always. Um, I didn't realize there were two uh, letters published in Science critiquing me. I think it was just that one that we responded to, um, but please let me know if I missed something. I assume they would have told me too. Um, so the, just for the general audience, intermediate disturbance hypothesis is similar to what we were talking about with the pigs earlier. If you have tons and tons of pigs and the whole landscape is rooted up, you're really going to lose, um, your species that aren't tolerant of that kind of disturbance are going to disappear. If you have no pig disturbance, then the species that, that prefer disturbance are also going to disappear. So this is an idea that somewhere in the middle, there's a sweet spot where biodiversity is optimized by disturbance. Um, and there is some evidence for this, but it's always complicated, partly because ecology is scale dependent. Um, processes at one, at a patch, a plot scale can be very opposite than processes on a landscape scale. Um, but I think what Paul is asking is how do we reconcile the fact that these animals, feral horses and donkeys can have really strong effects on vegetation and soils? And that's a great question. Um, I sometimes am frustrated though, because when I go out trying to find these areas that are supposedly so heavily impacted by horses, all I find are cattle. Mm -hmm. And I find it odd that most of the literature about the pervasive um, overpopulation of horses is based on management recommendations that have populations as low as 60 animals to 100 animals, while those same landscapes have 10,000 to 50,000 cattle. Oh, yeah. It makes me really confused as to how we describe what um, should be. Um, the other component of it is that the way a lot of ecology and conservation biology and management for the last century has been based on numbers. It's been a numbers game of how many animals should be in a place. But that has really, it's really disconnected from what actually happens, what those animals actually do. The effects of organisms are modified by their behavior in strong ways. Having a herd of 500 horses that are being hunted and that are moving over a large landscape um, and occupying any patch of that landscape for short periods of time 
is very different than having the same number of cattle sitting in that same land, in that landscape and not moving or having that same number of horses dispersed across it. Um, and those behavioral aspects to the way these animals influence ecosystems remain largely unknown. Um, and I would love to understand it before making any recommendation about what we do. Mm. Um, I think that there's a lot we can do to mitigate the types of effects horses and burrows have by finally questioning our pervasive policies of predator control. Um, predator control leads to increased depredation on livestock. There's absolutely no scientific evidence showing that it works for its supposed aims. It's an unscientific and ancient form of environmental manipulation that appears to also have inadvertent effects on these animals like brumbies and mustangs and donkeys and burros. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I, I'm, I, I can't wait to replay this um, webinar because there's just so much information that you've put out, Eric, that um, hasn't even crossed, I know, my mind and ma maybe some others out there in terms of all the points you've brought up, you know, with the body mass and how such a large uh, proportion of the megafauna is actually introduced, um, which is, yeah, quite, quite amazing. Um, but I think, you know, here, here in Australia, we've got um, pretty much the, the, the um, what's being put out to the general public is that introduced is bad and native is good. And that is something that really needs to be um, bro broken down because I certainly see that, you know, every animal does have a purpose um, and, you know, they should be considered. And that's, a, I mean, that's the heart of this in many ways. Um, yeah. I mean, not everybody who's, who's uh, working with these, responding to these animals, managing these animals is taken with the ideas of nativism, but it is something that we're trained in in ecology. And um, it's actually really interesting because, um, you know, here in Denmark, I have a lot of friends that are engineers or physicists or chemists, and I tell them I'm, I'm an ecologist yeah. and they don't know what ecology is. But then I say, I study invasive species and they know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm. The idea of invasion um, fits really tightly and easily into our cultural narratives. Yeah. Um, and yet I find it to be one of the most ridiculous scientific phrases. It's an anthropomorphic metaphor, mm -hmm. heavily value laden, heavily emotive, which infers, insinuates that these animals built ships to rape and pillage. Yeah prevents us from studying them as wildlife. Yeah. In, a, in an invasion perspective, any documented change in an ecosystem is immediately a negative effect by mm. definition. Mm. And that is, I, it, you can't, it just becomes a tautology. Mm. Um, yeah. The same effects of a native herbivore, if that animal is thought to be introduced, are now described as harms. Yeah. One really interesting example, um, there are monitor lizards on some islands in Polynesia. These animals um, surely couldn't have got there on their own. So they were assumed to be invasive, introduced animals. Mm -hmm. And conservationists urged those governments to eradicate them. So that became the conservation objective, killing these lizards because of their horrible effects on birds and nesting sea turtles and other organisms. It turns out when people did genetics that those animals have been there for thousands and thousands of years, long before humans, and are actually endemic subspecies. What happened to those horrible effects now? Did they poof? Yeah. That is the whole thing with it. it, it you can't escape the question, the type of questions you're asking are always going to find the answer they want to find when you study them from that perspective. Yeah. That's something that, you know, isn't looked Thanks, at Sarah. here in Australia. For example, in the Alpine National Park, they want all to basically remove most brumbies, you know, cull them down to a much smaller population, but there's never ever any research done on what will happen if those large herbivores are actually removed. And the same, there's a population, a very small population in Varma National Park, maybe 350 horses, wild horses. There's, there's been no research done on what will happen even in that small area, if the, that population is removed. There's never any research done. I won't say about the benefits, <laughs> but how it will actually impact the environment just doesn't happen. I mean, mm. I've seen that in North America mm. as well. Um, 
they removed wild burrows from um, Ash Meadows National Wildlife Refuge in the 90s. They fenced them out. And I'm not sure if they shot the ones that were stuck in the fence or not. Um, and many of the wetlands there, which are disconnected from flood disturbance, mm -hmm. um, groundwater fed wetlands. And they had big pools of water and a bunch of endemic fish populations in these desert springs. This also happened in Australia. Um, there's a great paper that looked at both cases um, by Kodrick Brown. And if anyone's interested, they can email me. I'll send you the PDF. Okay. Um, when these animals are removed, these wetlands that don't get disturbance from flooding filled in with vegetation and the, these endemic fish that trying that people were trying to protect by building those fences actually went extinct. A number of those populations went extinct, especially in the middle size and smaller wetlands that didn't have enough depth to keep open water habitat in response to the loss of these grazing. Um, I've been doing work in Death Valley National Park where they are removing the burrows. Um, and some of those sites, like that picture I showed you here, um, are really, you know, trampled open. This happens to be a site right next to a, a, a campground where there's no mountain lions. If you go down to a site right here where there's lots of mountain lion kills, I mean, I think there, when I went there last, there were eight fresh burrow carcasses in a pot, donkey carcasses in a pile in the thicket. Um, definite mountain lion kills. Uh, it's forested, but the burrows create pools, um, open water pools. Otherwise, the place looks like a thick um, cattail um, thicket with water availability, water about two meters down beneath dead vegetation. So that change when the donkeys are removed is gonna be profound and it's gonna be yeah. benefit some species and harm other species, um, just like any organism would. So, so what, what's the actual population of, of donkeys in the Kimberleys? How many? I'm not sure. Um, I don't know how many are left. I think just a couple hundred on Chris's property. Oh. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's tragic. That's tragic. Um, just another thing too that um, people may or may not be aware of is that Australia, compared to many other countries um, in the world, have an outrageous amount of national parks compared to other countries. Um, I think the USA has about 420 national parks. Australia's got close to 700. Um, Brazil has about 69. So Given that Australia is really top heavy in national parks, that has a huge influence on the um, management plans and practices and policies that are being placed on vast areas within our country. And that's, you know, primarily the position that um, Brumbies are, are in is because so much of our land has now been, I mean, I, I, in, in my opinion, I, I think that um, the national parks that we have clearly don't measure up internationally what they should be, um, but they are now all being relabeled as national parks. And that's had a huge uh, effect on what management plans are, are happening in these places, Eric. That's true. I mean, it depends on, you know, every place is different. The perspective people are taking to manage to... Mm -hmm treat wildlife. Yeah. Um, one thing about national parks in Australia too is that to kill red foxes, I mean, it is my understanding that all national parks poison bait, which yeah. means that they, they lack functional dingo populations. Yes. Um, which is one of the only countries in the world where national parks are like, if you want to, <laughs> if you want to know where, where uh, dingoes aren't, the top yeah. of that list is national parks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Well, I think even once again for agriculture, there's, there's this you know, baiting for wild dogs, which is really dingoes. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. Notwithstanding freedom of information that another group I'm involved in, we've obtained, in actual fact, the predation uh, is very low compared to stock loss. So that, but that's another complete topic, mm. <laughs> isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And just, um, sorry, Eric, go ahead. No, it's just interesting. The, um, the research about what happens when you kill predators to protect livestock is is quite conclusive, but still the opposite of what people do. Yeah. Um, the more you kill predators, generally the more depredation increases. And for many predators, you get higher prey de predator densities. Hmm. Coyotes, shoot coyotes, you get more coyotes and they breed earlier or and more frequently. Hmm. Um, so the whole thing is counterproductive and yet uh, we just can't let go of it, I guess. Keep doing it. No. Um, Same with mountain lions. There's a study that showed that if you, I think it's, um, 
probability of a depredation on livestock increases by some 30, 30%, I could find the number, uh, mm -hmm. following the killing of a mountain lion. Wow. So you kill a mountain lion to protect your livestock, you actually get more predation afterwards. And that was a meta-analysis across a number of studies. Yeah, but in Australia, what they do then is to ramp up the 1080. I don't think 1080 is used in America now, is it, in that way? As it's used no, here no. to bait for foxes and, and wild dogs, a.k.a. dingoes. So that's what's happening here. And aerial baiting, it's just abhorrent. Yeah, they just throw it out the helicopter. Mm. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? I, I saw a hand raised and some other things. I'm trying not to get distracted by looking yeah, at Yeah, there's the, another, uh, there's a couple of questions. Questions. Um, Jason Fieldhouse has put a question up. There has been many comments and criticisms that Brumby riparian damage of a fragile alpine environment. Mm -hmm. Has there been research to this that has led to degradation of ecosystems? I don't know if you can so scroll down and see that one, yeah. There's some papers on um, on horse effects in the Alpine Zone in the in the White Mountains in Australia. Um, the research is quite it leaves you wanting more because it's usually much strangely much of the research in Australia. Uh, the researchers can come up with a damage index, so yeah. hmm. low and the damage index is basically synonymous with the presence of the herbivore. Hmm. So yeah. the more track sign and trampling, the, the 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 higher the damage, and that's pretty much the extent of what we know. There was some work that showed a, a, a slight correlation, a negative correlation between horse effects and one of your endangered rodents, which could be true. Um, the broad I would not, be not no. the broad tooth rat. It's the broad tooth rat. Tooth rat. <laughs> yeah. Um, which I, which so, I mean, I do think we have an ethical obligation to care about broad tooth rats as much as we yeah. do about horses. But I would like to know, to understand how horses use those environments and what kind of factors could reduce or change how they use it. In my own research, most of these systems, uh, many of the systems where equids are having effects on vegetation and wetlands have a great deal of heterogeneity. There's, there's areas where they don't go and there's areas that they do go. Mm -hmm. um, and my data suggests that that's by mountain lions, by predation risk. Um, it would be really interesting to know what would happen in Australia if dingoes were protected in those alpine yeah. zones. Mm -hmm. um, and you'd probably get uh, a changing of those effects to be more heterogeneous across the landscape, more yeah. diverse across. The There's too but much interference. That's the problem. Mm. What? There's too much interference with the whole ecosystem. Mm. There's other there's other underlying changes, right? Mm. Um, I mean, just to give an example, many people used to study um, introduced tamarisk in the southwest as this invasive species. It was the invader that came in and changed these ecosystems. Um, a lot of people then started looking at what tamarisk needs to germinate and to establish what kind of conditions it prefers relative to the native riparian plants. And it became clear that a big part of the story, not the entirety of the story, of why tamarisk is so su successful and has changed the character of these rivers is because we dammed the rivers. Mm. Uh, my PhD advisor, Daniel Ramp, very well, he said this very well in that we uh, externalize our own guilt onto other organisms. Mm. And I think that's a very, yeah. I think that's very true. That's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, just being mindful of the time because we thought we would probably do it, do this in about 45. Um, we've just, um, I think we're sort of over an hour. And I think what we've covered um, has been, yeah, amazing, Eric. I, just, um, I, I saw one comment from Candace. It looks like I went, I misunderstood her comment. So I'm sorry that I came off too strong, Candace. I wasn't talking about the idea. I understood, but I'm, I'm not. Yeah. Be attacked. Well, Eric, I think, if it's time, I think if you're happy about that, we might wind up now. So yeah. I'd really, really like yeah. to thank you very much for joining us and spending the time and doing your marvellous slide presentation i'm sure Brilliant. Well, i've got questions <laughs> i've got more questions um and i will email you about that um paper you spoke about yes. and also the paper you mentioned about wetlands there was a wetlands paper would be interesting as yes. well yeah so, I, I email those out and you can send them to the group yeah That'd and i great. can make them available on the net so that would be really great so thank you eric thank you so much yeah and Thanks thank you renee thank you. No worries. <laughs> All right. Appreciate it. Bye, everyone. Bye, Eric. Thanks, Eric. Bye. Thank Bye, you. Ruth. Thanks, everyone, for your questions. 
And thank yeah. you everyone for coming to the webinar. Absolutely. Okay, next bye. time. Okay, bye. bye. I'll switch off. Stop recording. Excellent.